ever felt frustrated and helpless after listening and doing everything your vet told you to do, but it only made your sick pet worse and not get any better? That's me in 2008 with my first adopted cat, Meow. I did everything the vet told me to do and I realised she wasn't getting any better and only worse. So I decided to look into alternative health options and was drawn to the stories of holistic pet service entrepreneurs and their transformative journey, overcoming obstacles, chasing their passion and creating a movement that has caused a ripple effect of positive change in the lives of their clients and pets around the world. Join me as I share the raw, inspiring journeys of these amazing entrepreneurs, their successes and failures. My name is Amrys Wang and this is The Raw Entrepreneur. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world right now. This is Amrys Wang of The Raw Entrepreneur. I am most blessed and honoured to have been given the opportunity to do this special interview with Dr. Karen Shaw Becker, co-author of the most anticipated book of the year by longevity junkies and pet parents around the world and is already listed number one Amazon bestseller in several countries including my home country Singapore and will be printed in nine languages and counting The Forever Dog by Dr. Karen Shaw Becker and Rodney Habib which will be released to the world on 12th of October 2021. I highly recommend all animal lovers out there who want to learn how to become a better caregiver for your own companion animal, even if it's not a dog, to get this book and be inspired by it. And on a personal note, thank you, Dr. Becker and Rodney Habib, for inspiring me to become a better pet parent for my animals. Who is Dr. Karen Becker, please? Oh, goodness. Dr. Karen Becker is a person that was put on this earth to care for animals. And that's what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that was a really short answer, but that is, that is the truth. I was, I was put on this earth to, to fix and care for animals. Did you always have this feeling since you were young or, you know, did you, when did you think that you become a vet? those are two different questions. I've had this feeling in me. I was born with this feeling to want to care for other creatures that can't care for themselves. I didn't think I was smart enough to be a veterinarian because I don't, I didn't like chemistry and math, but I also learned, I was a wildlife rehabilitator before I became a veterinarian. I knew when I was a wildlife rehabilitator at 14, by 16, I knew I had to become a vet, even if I didn't think I was smart enough, when I, which I didn't. I knew I had to try because I was going to the vet like three or four times a week. And that was for emergencies during the day when the vet was open. I had so many animal emergencies at night that broke my heart because these animals needed care. And it was, you know, it hit by car animal at two o'clock in the morning and I didn't have what I needed to fix them. And that's the worst feeling ever knowing that an animal needs medical care you know all about this you have a kitty that needs medical care and you can't provide it there's nothing there's no more hopeless feeling than that so that feeling of being helpless made me get tutors for chemistry and tutors for math and tutors for physics all the subjects that don't resonate with my personality i just started at the beginning with like remedial math and remedial physics and remedial chemistry. And I just did the work I took. I got tutors. I took summer classes and I got through those really tough classes because I was not going to let anything stop me from accomplishing my goal of becoming a vet. Wow. So would you say you're more of a left brain kind of person or right brain kind of person? It's a great question. I think Looking back, what's so interesting is sometimes I, I really love lecturing to kids who want to become veterinarians. And I hear so many kids say, I'd like to be a vet, but I just can't get through the science part. I love science. I love science. I just don't like math and physics, but math and physics 
actually are something that I use every day. When I became a physical therapist for dogs, you use body mechanics daily, like that's physics. And that every single day that I calculate herbal doses, drug doses, every time I'm calculating medication for an animal, that's math. So I do use math and physics on a daily basis. I just use them with real life, real life scenarios that make it really easy for my brain to comprehend. It's sitting in class for eight hours, looking at obscure word problems that really doesn't resonate with me. What I realize is I actually do like math and physics, but I like real life math and physics. So I think I'm a blend of both left and right brain. It's a good question, but I think I'm, I think I have a little bit of both going on. So I think you're more of an intuitive in that sense, because you, yes. yeah. you, 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 you like physical, practical energy, and then you start working physically to solve a problem. Mm-hmm. I think, I think that that sounds a it bit is. more like you. Um, when you started to study as a vet, as a vet student, um, as we all know, it's a very conventional school of thought, vet school. Mm-hmm. Um, how was your journey as a vet student to the vet that you are today? How did that, how, how, how's that transform? So I went to veterinary school already thinking really outside the box for two reasons. My parents are super proactive humans. So my parents are ready, raising me, eating organic food raising me, telling me that, you know, family walks were a big thing. We walked our dog three times a day. We were outside. We were working in the garden. My, my parents role modeled a very healthy life, but on top of my parents being proactive humans, which of course then led me to be a proactive human and ask all those proactive questions. For instance, let me give you an example. My wellness class in veterinary school was In community medicine, your senior year, you go through a rotation called community medicine or wellness medicine, and it's designing vaccine protocols for puppies and kittens. And that's cool. I'm glad I had that experience. But I remember distinctly asking my wellness supervisor, mentor, teacher, hey, this is fine, designing vaccines protocols. When are we going to learn about preventing obesity and kidney failure and heart disease and autoimmune disease? Like, when do we learn? the preventive strategies that actually mean wellness. And I'll never forget, there's just glazed over stare, like, what are you talking about? There was no proactive wellness. The concept still has not reached human medicine, really, and certainly not reached veterinary medicine. But my second mentor was a homeopath, a wildlife rehabilitator named Barbara Harvey, who introduced me to homeopathy when I was 16. That shifted everything for me because homeopathy, in my opinion, is about the strangest, weirdest form of holistic medicine. It's just weird. But I saw it work before I was a doctor, before the possibility for me to be super judgmental was there, before I even could pronounce homeopathy. I didn't know how it worked, but I also at 16, I didn't care, right? I just saw it work and that was good. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even trained to be a critical enough thinker to be like, listen, I don't know why it worked, but we have to reverse engineer this because I'm not sure that this is even viable. And I, I didn't know enough to even question what I saw. I saw the medicine work and I just kept using it. Then I went to vet school and I will never forget asking my pharmacology (laughs) instructor about Arnica. Arnica is a homeopathic we use for blunt force trauma. Like if you have a bird hit by a car, you give them Arnica because it helps with bruising, body inflammation, pain. And I remember asking about Arnica and pharmacology and I will never forget my teacher saying, what? Like the exact same response I got when I asked about proactive wellness medicine, about intensely preventing disease from occurring. The concepts of actually thinking outside the box going through those four years are non-existent. So I had the best words of advice from Barbara Harvey, the woman who taught me about homeopathy. She said, she called me the night before I went to vet school and she said, Karen, just zip it, don't question, Don't get yourself kicked out. Get through your four years of formal training, which is going to teach you how to knit the body together with blunt force trauma and acute injuries. It's going to teach you about infectious disease. It's not going to teach you anything about preventing the body from getting sick. It's not going to teach you anything about keeping animals living longer in a body that's resilient and strong. It's going to teach you nothing about nutrition. Just get through it so you can learn how to fix things if they're hit by a car and then keep 
learning because those four years in veterinary school are invaluable for infectious disease and acute trauma. But you are not going to learn anything in veterinary school about how to keep the body well or how to prevent the body from breaking. So just keep learning. Those are the best, wisest words anyone has ever told me. And that's what I did. I am, I have been in a class teaching myself, educating myself beyond those four years since I graduated. Um, and I think that that's a pretty accurate assessment of veterinary school. They teach you amazing tools for acute trauma and infectious disease, but we are not necessarily provided amazing insights on how to prevent the body from breaking. And that is, of course, as a proactive wellness veterinarian, it's all I do now. So now I'm on a mission to go back and retrain veterinary students to be able to have tools in their toolbox so that they are capable of having knowledge to prevent the body from breaking. I think that will accomplish a twofold mission that will prevent veterinarians from burning out, becoming depressed. It will help manage and mitigate our professional suicide rate, I hope because we're giving doctors more tools so that they have a whole lot more hope and a whole lot less desperation in their careers. It also makes patients feel so much better. We're not, as doctors, we're not dealing with the heartbreak of the body breaking and then trying to patch it back together. We're partnering with our clients to prevent the body from breaking down. That gives hope to everyone, the least of which is our blessed patients who feel better in their bodies longer with less disease because we haven't allowed them to get sick and degenerate. So I am on a mission to shift the paradigm from a disease model to a wellness model. I'm halfway done with my career and I think I'm about 25% along my mission. So I have more work to do, but before I die, that is my goal. Wow. Now, you know, um, I've been looking forward to the book that you, mm. you've been working on for over a year now. Um, I think it's like a life, it's almost like, like a culmination of your life work going into this book, um, The Forever Dog. Um, what would you say is the impetus for you to do the book? Rodney and I had several goals in writing The Forever Dog. First, it's to begin introducing this concept of the paradigm shift that needs to happen when we think about how we approach wellness and disease, as well as accepting midlife degeneration. So both of us really wanted to start a conversation and we preferably an international conversation about why we're conditioned to believe that that the body's meant to break midway through life and then animals, you know, they're born. And then it's a slow, steady decline of the body unraveling, degeneration occurring. First there, you know, you may have some joint issues and then some organ dysfunction and then allergies, immune systems start to go. And if it's not an overactive immune system, then it's an underactive and you get a diagnosis of cancer. All of these diseases, degenerative diseases, not infectious diseases, all of these lifestyle related issues that are affecting dogs and cats both. We're taught to just accept. And for me, I wanted to write this book because I know having set up and started and hosted a proactive wellness hospital in the US, the first of its kind, I know it works, I've done it. I've got 15,000 patients living a proactive longevity junkie, vibrant bodies that are old dogs. I have seen it. So helping, one cohort of people in Chicago was a great first step. Now I want to help the world. That was my goal. Rodney is obsessed with the oldest dogs in the world and why. And so I came at this from kind of a science perspective. I want to know the research and the science behind why making better choices allows the body more resiliency. And he came at it with wanting to know from the owners, the guardian's perspective, are these dogs just genetic outliers? Like maybe it's just a fluke. Maybe the universe just blessed a handful of dogs and there's nothing to it. But what if there's more? What if these owners were doing some intentional things that actually doubled their dog's lifespan? If that was the case, he wanted to find out. So we came together. I went and got the science from the scientists and he went and got the background from the owners of the oldest dogs. And then we put it together. And how long did that take for you to work on this book? Two years. Wow. That's yeah. a lot of work. It sounds like the forever dog, you bring the science 
of wellness and he brings the art of wellness together. That's correct. Yeah. He is. You know? He's the creator artist. He, he absolutely is that creative. He wants the conversation. He, when he was interviewing these guardians of these dogs, I wanted to ask a lot more of like the nitty gritty questions, but he, you're absolutely right. He wanted to know how happy were the dogs and how did the owners judge their happiness and what level of stress was in their life. So his entire approach as a creative, as an artist is very different from mine, but it's equally as valuable when telling the story. And the neatest part about the scientists that I interviewed is that I do see science starting to shift to allow a conversation about some of these topics like emotional stress and um, happiness factors. Those are things that when I went through vet school, we were told strictly that that is not a part of the scientific conversation. You don't need to have that. Things are different. And all of the top longevity scientists that we spoke to all mentioned or focused on that emotional mental component of what makes us happy and joyful on the inside also makes ourselves happy and joyful on the inside. And I thought that was pretty magnificent because that's a conversation that was not being had 20 years ago. So I liked very much this blending of the art and science of longevity coming together in this book. So what would you say was... Um the most challenging part of creating this book for you? Hands down, the most challenging part for me and Rodney too, I'm going to speak for both of us. We wanted to write a book that for the 19 year old that just accidentally went to the pet store and got a puppy mill dog and feeding it the food that she got at the grocery store if she happens to see a copy of this book at her local store and picks it up, I don't want her to feel intimidated. I don't want her to feel shameful. I don't want her to have regret. I want her to feel empowered, but I also want her to be able to read it and say, I understand what these people are trying to teach me and I'm thankful I can institute these steps. I got it. At the same time, I wanted to reach my peers, my conventional veterinary peers, who all I hear my entire life is show me the science. You better show me the science. That's a great theory. I want to see the science. I literally referenced every sentence so that it is bulletproof for people saying, I don't know if, if I can believe that. Well, here's the research. And then on top of that, Amaris, we hired one of the top science writers we could find to double check and third party validate all of our research. And the reason that we hired Kristen Loberg, you're gonna see at the bottom of the book with Kristen Loberg, Kristen Loberg is an amazing science writer. She writes for all of the type human medical doctors in the sense of credentializing all that they're saying. So we wanted this book to not just validate brand new science that has not yet reached veterinary medicine. We needed a person to be able to independently say, these authors are not cherry picking their data. They are not picking studies that are not accurately representing the science. We needed a third party to come in, read the entire book and basically critique it from a third party validation standpoint. And we did that. Then we recognized, of course, because we want this book to shift this paradigm from a reactive disease model to a proactive wellness model. I know that I'm going to get my critics of which there are many reading this book with notepad in hand, waiting to criticize. So we also wrote this book for all of those people that are stuck in a mindset saying, I think that this is BS, but I'm gonna read it just to find out. I want those people to close the book, take a deep breath, and at best they can say, I don't agree with necessarily what's going on, but I can't say why, because it's all validated. I'm just going to have to agree to disagree. At best, I want to silence my critics to be able to say, we're just going to have to disagree, but I can't tell you why. So we wrote that book for all three of those people, brand new pet parents, seasoned pet parents, people that don't want regrets, veterinarians that need to know more, and a lot of professional critics that are waiting to say, 
there's no science because we did include so much science that it's just non-negotiable. That was the hardest part. We wrote for the scientific community and brand new pet owners and veteran pet owners all in one book. The book started out, Amherst, like 700 pages. <laughs> and then Harper and then Harper Collins said, you got to cut half the book, not half. They said, you got to cut out 200 pages. It's like cutting off a limb. I, I cried. I was like, oh, every single paragraph I deleted, I'm like, oh, goodbye. It was sad, but we whittled it down to about 400 pages of what I hope, what we hope is the best information to not intimidate or make anyone feel guilty, but said and done, our goal is to give people a blueprint to cover all aspects of their dog's environment. Because that's the other piece that I have seen missing. People focus so much on diet that they forget about all of the other lifestyle variables. That's the big thing. Yeah, I, I love the word that you use, blueprint. Um, it's one of my favorite phrases actually in life now. Because I'm actually really into personal self-development, especially the last few years. So Good. I've been um, doing a lot of internal self, un unscrewing the mind, shall we say, right? Good for you. And, and as I was doing that and also learning from you and Rodney about how to take better care of the animals, you know, a light bulb sort of came up. Like what I'm trying to do for myself is in parallel, in step yes. with exactly what you guys are advocating for the animals as well, you know, yeah. and basically, you know, a phrase has been coming into my, my head, um, especially this year, and it's basically conscious caregiving, you know, beautiful, conscious beautiful. caregiving, and that, that has been something that I've been refining in my head since last year, I do love COVID because it gave me the opportunity to take a step back and to really deep dive into myself and you know where am I in this universe and how I want to give back and it's, it, it, it's so beautiful that you have done that and that that is how you have decided to spend your time I'm not only am I so proud of you that is that it will powerfully shift how you care for others, other humans, but also other animals powerfully. Yeah. Powerfully. So my mission has been more, there's been more clarity since mm -hmm. I started my podcast, uh, which was last year, 7 of May to now. And basically, you know, I am focusing more on conscious caregiving for animals, not just for the animals, but also for the caregivers. Because I'm a, I'm a volunteer animal rescuer in Singapore. So I know the rescuer's mindset. You know, I almost mm -hmm. fell into the deep, dark hole of rescuing where it can suck the soul out of you. And there's a very fine line between a rescuer and a hoarder. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and this is something that is very close to my heart. So for you and mm -hmm. the teachings that you guys have been advocating all these years, to come together in this forever book, which to be honest, and I tell a lot of people, I've been encouraging people to buy your book. And I said, you know, you don't have to be a dog owner to buy this book, mm. you know, um, because whatever you guys has, you've been teaching and, 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 and sharing with us, you know, both um, in public and in inside scoop, because I'm a proud inside scooper myself, you know, is that you can apply the, the philosophies and techniques, you just have to tweak it a bit for the species. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, it's the same thing, you know. Um, and again, it's the same approach for humans as well. If we can learn to have more self-care and love for ourselves, we will actually in turn become much better conscious caregivers, more intentional in what we do for the animals as well. And that's what I love about, I'm looking forward to your book because, yeah. you know, you have that blueprint, you know, that guide to show everyone. Um, and that's why, I, like I keep telling my friends, like, you don't have to be a dog owner. You just have to be an animal person. Just get the book because you're going to gain a lot of nuggets from it. You know, I haven't even read it, but I know it in my heart. I know it. Well, you know what I love? First of all, I think part of the reason that you have an expanded vantage point 
is because you have intentionally worked on yourself. That conscious caregiving, many people, many animal lovers I have seen, incredible humans, sacrifice everything in their life, their money, their time, their home, their relationships. Animals are first in their life. And it's amazing. But they have denied themselves their own care and personal evolution. And that ultimately will not serve them well because it's out of overflow. It's out of our best, most evolved version of ourselves that we can best help those around us. And if we are stuck, empty, emotionally broken, with fractured relationships that morph into anxiety or personality struggles, it's a, like you said, it's a dark hole. It's a dark hallway that doesn't have a light at the end of the tunnel. Whereas if we take the time and the effort, but also the guts to be alone with our thoughts, figure out who we are, where we want to go, what we want to do, what we're going to change about ourselves, who we want to be in one year, five years, 10, 10 years. If, if we do the hard work on the inside, the end result is a much better, longer, sustainable approach to loving those on the outside. You've done that. You're doing that. I, I'm doing that. I'm a work in progress as we all are. But I think recognizing that self-care isn't selfish it's critical for us to become the best versions to serve those around us to our utmost capacity. And I'm so proud and happy of you for doing the work, the internal work to begin the process of expansion because it's out of the expansion that you're able to reach more people. You reach more people because you have this unbelievable longer patience with recognizing I am on my path and I'm not where I want to be. And there are people behind you and there are people in front of you. But the goal is to help the people along that we can learn from those in front of us on the path, judge no one, walk and tread very lightly and do everything we can to continually sustain our own evolution as humans while simultaneously caring for those animals and people around us that desperately need us. It's both. It's not you're just caring for things around you or you're just caring for yourself. You have to learn how to multitask, right? You have to learn how to care for yourself while caring for everything that the universe puts in front of you. And it's not an either or, it's both. And it's out of both that you will be able to rescue your whole life and not burn out. That you will be able to rescue and be a light to the hoarders around you. You'll be able to go into a hoarding situation and lovingly help discern that situation, not in judgment or with anger or with frustration, but it's because you've taken the time to ground and center yourself first, or at least in an ongoing process. And I'm so happy that you're there because if all animal loving people focused on love themselves as much as they loved all of our snot nose, three legged, one eyed rescues, we would be at a place to be able to have a more balanced, consistent, and ongoing perpetual ability to care and love for, for our whole lives. It's not going to burn out and it's not going to shift. We just become stronger because we're doing that internal work. I think that that is part of the message that you and I and everyone else in our community need to begin talking about. One of the things in the Forever Dog book that we say over and over is that health travels up the leash. So if you can't love yourself enough to take good care of yourself, then love your dog enough because by you detoxing your home and switching to you know less toxic cleaning products and you cleaning up the air environment and you putting a water filter in yeah you did it for your dog but guess what you're going to be drinking less waterborne contaminants as well so the cool thing about animals is that for people that can't love themselves animals do provide a means for us to a roundabout way love ourselves because by loving them and by improving the environment for them we ultimately are the the we get the the passive effects of a cleaner, healthier home because of our animals. The other cool thing that the scientists shared with us that I really enjoyed was how important it is for us to have a good, clear mental state as owners and guardians, because our animals know, they know whether we want to talk about it or not, we're not fooling our animals. If we have anxiety or depression mm. or any other, if the monkeys are not saying good things in our brains, and if we think for a minute, we might be fooling our parents and our friends and our spouses and our, our mates, but we are not fooling our dogs and cats. And that's an important thing to know. Quantum physics. 
It's and all vibration. And it's all vibration, but dogs and cats can smell and feel. They have a, what Dr. Biagio Daniello says, a, you know, a six, seven, and eight sense. Kitties have nine and 10. Mm. Kit, animals are well equipped to pick up on, yes, vibrational differences, but also the hormones we secrete in response to our emotions. Those chemo signals are secreted through our pores and our animals can smell them. That's why when we come in, I mean, that's why when, when we come back from anywhere, our animals are like, yeah, they want to know if we've touched another dog or have you betrayed it? You know, when you take your kitty to the vet and come home, they want to know what other kitties you may have been around. But the other thing that they're discerning is how's it going on the inside? right? Are you angry? Are you angry, frustrated? Are, are you, what emotions are flowing through our blood because our animals know? So there again, if you're living in a state of chronic depression, or if you are living in any state that isn't healthy for your carton, don't feel like, I don't want to say fixing yourself because it sounds like you're broken. But if you don't want to work up the emotional scale for yourself, our animals are pretty powerful motivators because research has shown that it negatively affects their lifespan by staying in that icky state. So animals are amazing for lots of reasons, but one of the things they do is make us be better humans and guardians by default. And I love that. And we write a lot about that in the book. Yeah. I, if honestly, if it wasn't for all your longevity tips that you've always been sharing, you know, and the studies, um, and then me just wanting to do do the best for my dogs and my and my cats, you know, I realized by helping them, I was yeah. improving my lifestyle, my home environment. Because of my cat, I started to look into greener house cleaning products, mm. you know, um, filtered yeah. water, you know, things like that, even the air. Um, so I, I always tell my, my friends, you know, like, you know, yes, I'm really like into this holistic, holistic lifestyle into, you know, you might call it the woo, -woo but the thing is, it's because of my animals, because yeah. whatever I apply to help them heal and become healthier, it helps me too, That's right. you know, and, and that is something that I will forever be very grateful to have animals in my life. Yeah, because they they are to me they are basically like angels sent from heaven, you know. Literally, here, they yeah. yeah they they are here to teach us to to guide yeah. us to so that we learn to help us try and keep learning and learning and to you know learn from our mistakes, learn from experience. The negative is not always forever negative. You turn the negative yeah. into a positive, you know. It's like qigong. Um, or Tai Chi, where it's always yeah. a transformation of energy, negative and positive. It's yeah. always going to be there, the flow, you know, and that's what I love about you and Rodney, which is very interesting, as you were saying, you know, you guys bring the art and science together into this book. You know, you have the science, the science resiliency, the, 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 the technical, you know, skills, all the, the ethics all in there, you know, and you yet will have the, the humanity put in there mm -hmm. as well, you know, from a pet parent. And, I, and don't you love, I, I love the fact that we can now have this conversation about both aspects that are important without the science community no longer getting offended and the healers, which we all are. If we have, you know, if you own an animal or, you know, you're in your carton, you, you may not know that you are a healer, but you, everyone has the innate ability for our bodies to heal, but we also have the ability to make excellent choices that can facilitate a healing response. So as a guardian, kind of like if you own a dog or cat, you are a dog trainer because you're training your dog, whether you know what you're doing or not, and you, you're conditioning your kitty, whether you know what you're doing or not. I love the fact that we can have conversations about the emotional, mental, even spiritual aspects of what, how to best supply our animals' emotional needs while best meeting their physical needs, their mechanical needs, their nutritional needs. We can have those conversations blended into one finally. And that is a refreshing shift that wasn't being discussed 20 years ago. So I do believe that there is evolution happening. 
My goal for this book is because we went to the top human longevity scientists in the world and knowing that they are doing there are many of them were already studying the samples the dna samples they're already studying the metabolomics of some of these old methuselah dogs they were already researching the dna as well as fecal samples urine samples dna swabs they're already reverse engineering some of these older dogs but the cool thing is that included in the conversation was things about their environment including how much fresh air did they get and um, how much interaction did they get with their moms and dads? Yes, we asked about what food they were eating and what, what their chemical exposure was. And did they have a job? But at the same time, Darcy, a 21-year-old dog from Australia, Darcy's mama intentionally kind of scheduled play date. So did Tigger's mama, um, the, the pit bull from Waco, Texas, also 21 years old. They both scheduled play dates throughout their dog's life so that they they didn't know that a rich social life was one of the blue zone top reasons that old people tend to hang out is that they have communities, they feel accepted, they feel unconditional love. These two awesome pet parents just knew that they could see a shift in their dog, that their dog came back from visiting another dog body and their dog was happier having had a play date. So these two intuitive mamas just continued to schedule meetups with other dogs throughout these dogs' lives. That's pretty cool and pretty intuitive. And yet not something that a lot of people, I think in this day and age, think about how can I cultivate a rich social life for my dog? People think, oh, you gotta be kidding me, this is absurd. And yet study after study shows that social dogs, dogs that are able to interact with their own species, even if they have, you know, if you have a dog that's reactive or aggressive, if you can find one other dog that it accepts and that it can hang out with, you intentionally giving your dog time to be a dog, to smell butts and roll around in the dirt and dig and get dirty and be with other dogs, that does something pretty magical to their body in terms of reducing cortisol and improving their immune system. In addition to being able to exhibit normal doggy behaviors with their own species. So those are conversations that I'm so happy these top tier scientists brought up because those are all the things I think as pet parents we think about, yeah. but we don't know if it's appropriate scientifically to talk about it. It was so awesome that the scientists said, hey, don't forget this aspect of living a long time. It, part of this is a mental, emotional well being aspect. The brain body connection is something that we can finally talk about. And I love that. I love it. Wow. You know, um, remind me again when is the Forever Dog coming out? October 12th. Okay. Like, yeah, soon. A few weeks. Soon, soon. Really, really soon. So, you know, um, if listeners out there, if you haven't ordered the book yet, please, please, please do consider getting it. I've got several because I'm just that kind of person Aww. that I've got several, you know, um, and they're great for Christmas presents. I'm getting one for my vet, you know, just, just to nurture in the, you know, in to share her in that direction. Um, but I just, I just really want to say that you and Rodney have made such a profound impact mm. truly in, in the way I think and the way I, I look at things and the way I do things for my animals. Mm. You know, I might not do everything that you, that you share, but I take note, you know, and I think about it. I, and I see how I can, and, you know, in that sense, you give me permission to think out mm. of the box, mm. you know, you do. And I think that is what, with you looking at all those top tier scientists and, you know, in, in a sense, yeah, they gave you permission, like, hey, talk about these things, you know, it's time yeah. to talk about these things. And, you know, this book will give permission to pet parents, both dogs and cats and yeah. gerbils and rabbits, whatever, how really in essence to be a conscious pet parent how yeah. to use the art and science of well-being to improve the longevity of your animal. It's not just about making them live as long as possible. You want them right. to have the best quality of life. You want them to be happy because when they're happy, they're healthy. Yeah. Right. So good. So good. And I love, love, love that you are learning and what you learn have 
you know, it's resonating with you. And in turn, you are talking about it. Like you started a podcast that that's amazing. And you, you're taking what you've learned both on the inside and what you've learned on the outside with the animals that you're rescuing, the people you are meeting through rescue, you are literally integrating your personal inner life with your external passionate life towards helping the animals and people around you. You're blending that, that together beautifully. And I believe that we're called to do that in this life and you're doing it. And I'm so, I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of you with the, the intention of the heart that you are doing it with. You're incredibly open. You are, you're, you're not making judgments. You are welcoming to everyone that wants to have a conversation. And I do believe that that refreshing, balanced, kind approach is not just the direction that our animal wellness community needs to head in. We have leaders that are role modeling for the people around them how to do it beautifully. And you are that person. You're one of the lovely people working towards bringing our community together despite our differences and starting a conversation that many people need to hear about how happy, healthy humans can foster happy, healthy animals and the conversation about what it needs to be done and what the steps we need to take or some ideas and thoughts and suggestions to get there. It's an awesome ongoing lifelong conversation that you are participating in and, and mightily. So thank you for your contribution to this entire wellness evolutionary platform. Uh, thank you. Coming from you, it's a great honor. Um, Cause honestly, um, I suffer from imposter syndrome. I suffer from, mm. you know, a lot of, um, I question my intention sometimes, like, why am I doing mm. it? Because it's so easy sometimes to, uh, you know, to get overwhelmed by what people think. Um, and that is why I actually don't, I don't, I'm the worst marketing person in the world because I mm -hmm. don't even like check how many likes or followers I have. I don't even look at my downloads. I don't. I very healthy. That. I don't very look very healthy. And I don't just, read the comments. Yeah, I people just, are me. <laughs> all I all I all I'm all I care about is really to talk to people that I admire and I want yeah. to learn from. Yeah. So that I have this Beautiful. amazing masterclass with them, one to one like with Good. you. And and then after that I just put it out to the universe and share it. You know, so, so good. So I just want to so thank good. you. Yeah. So good. You are you are your approach is incredibly healthy and your intentions are pure. And so I think that those monkeys that tell us we're not good enough, right? Whatever, whatever the, you know, the, that those, those subconscious thoughts that the real that we play in our brain has a lot of different reasons for that being input, but we all experience those fears, those feelings of being inadequate. I think the, the difference is just doing it anyway, right? Just recognizing I'm in a state of fear, I'm going to do this anyway. Um, I, I don't like being on film or, you know, I don't like, but I'm going to do it anyway. I don't like, I don't necessarily feel comfortable doing it. I'm going to do it anyway. I think that just deciding that the passion and the desire to want to start the conversation trumps the criticisms and the self-doubt and all that comes with putting yourself out there because a lot comes with putting yourself out there. I, I, if I, if I chose to focus on all the people that disagreed with me and didn't like me and said horrible things, I could go down a really dark path fast. But I am choosing to keep my focus on, I know who I am, I know why I'm doing this. And my job is to serve my purpose in my body on this earth, which is to, to speak my truth. And that's what I'm doing. And if it doesn't resonate with you, I want people to say, she's not my girl and that's cool. And she's you know someone else's girl. And we can just all exist in our space yeah. doing what best resonates with us in a, in a way that doesn't harm anyone else and yet may provide a tremendous amount of education, hope, and enlightenment to people that do resonate with your message. You're teaching them mightily and you're giving them hope and information that will make them better guardians. That's what this is about for both of us. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Becker, for your time. Um, and I hope that, you know, we can have another conversation sometime in the future to, to follow up with everything. Because I think whatever you edited out of your 700 over pages, that can be a I part know. two in the book. And I'm looking True. forward to the forever cat. <laughs> Me as well. Me as well. And I love your support for, for the forever cat. We are too. 
So thank you so much for this. This is great. Wow. I'm so thankful and grateful that you took the time to listen to this podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could subscribe, download, rate, review, and share this with others whom you care about that may enjoy it as well. Thank you, and remember to be kind to yourself and others. Have a awesome day, everyone. <laughs>